In the last few years, the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science has welcomed several new faculty members, and we're taking some time this spring to introduce them to you. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Kevin Boley, who came to us in 2017 from McGill University in Montreal. Welcome to Weather World, Kevin. Thanks for having me, John. Our pleasure. You know, it's kind of neat. You've actually come full circle in some ways professionally. You got your BS at Penn State. Now you're back teaching some of the same courses you took when you were here. I mean, what's that experience been like? Yeah, it's, it's been a really great experience. Um, from the interview, it was amazing. I showed up in a department where suddenly I'm teaching the people who taught me, which was uh, a very surreal experience, but also I had a very friendly environment immediately when I showed up. Uh, I knew a lot of folks, uh, and even if I knew them as a student, getting to know them professionally as a, as a colleague was, was a, a very short leap and not challenging at all. And I, I've really enjoyed my time, time here thus far. Uh, and, and teaching classes that you've taught before is is unique, uh, and it's honestly it gives you I think a strategic advantage when you're really talking to students. It gives you a chance to, to empathize with them in a manner that um, I think we all can as students who have gone through an atmospheric science degree. But to specifically be able to say I've been in your shoes, I've sat in that chair, I've taken this class before, leaves you in a spot where you're you're really uniquely equipped to to really succeed and, and, and connect with the students in a in a manner that really I think improves their experience. And with you you can say something like, I was in your shoes a dozen years ago. With me, that number would be a lot bigger. So. <laughs> Not too much bigger though. <laughs> I know you like to innovate in your teaching. You're kind of getting a reputation in the department. Let's talk about that. You're a big fan of something called Doceri. You call it your favorite digital teaching tool. Give us the scoop on that. Yeah, the, the series has been a, a really great tool for me, uh, both in the classroom before we, of course, started the pandemic and, and also when we've been in our COVID times uh, with a lot of our remote teaching. Uh, in short, Docere gives me the chance to control whatever's on my desktop at any point in time uh, from an iPad. So I can be anywhere in a room as long as I'm in the same Wi-Fi network. Uh, I can control uh, my desktop. So opening and closing browsers, annotating PowerPoint presentations. Uh, annotating maps on the web and so on and so forth. Uh, in the times before we were in remote teaching, I was able to also hand the iPad over to students. They could annotate documents. So we would use that, for example, in our writing classes. We would edit documents and they could we could just pass the iPad around the classroom and students can write all over that. Uh, and I'm still able to do, do that. Maybe not quite in the same manner, of course, in today's era, uh, but something I'm looking forward to in the fall, hopefully once we uh, get back to a, a, more, uh, a more typical classroom for us. Yeah, and you know, that's so empowering to students because you're literally sort of handing off the class to them ever ever so briefly but still you know Absolutely. let's continue down this digital road marissa did a feature last week about safe place selfies you're you've become known around the department for your snowflake <laughs> selfies what are those and, and how do they fit into your teaching yeah, the, the snowflake selfies have been a really fun project, uh, and we were, we've been able to really take it to create a nice research to operations, as we sometimes call it, type scenario in the in our classroom. In this case, this is our principles of atmospheric measurements class, where we're trying to take various measurements of the atmosphere, but we're also trying to teach the students to write. Uh, and one of the best ways to engage a student in a, a full-on term project with a, a large writing component to it is to try and find the most interesting project you possibly can for them to, to engage in and to be a part of. Uh, in this case, we had them outside uh, when it was snowing, taking measurements of snow uh, and how much liquid is in the snow. But also one of the ways you can see this is through taking images of ice crystals and snowflakes. Um, they really truly hold a history of where they formed, how warm or how cold it was, how wet or how dry it was. And by taking a picture of a snowflake in a microscopic manner, in this case with a small uh, $5 microscope attached to a cell phone, you can realistically use that to, to get a really beautiful image of a snowflake but also as a chance to kind of tell the story and understand the science behind what actually caused that to form. Uh, and that project actually grew to the point where we were able to uh, publish this very recently in our bulletin of the American Meteorological Society uh, journal and actually kind of showcase to the larger meteorological community how effective this can be as a teaching tool. And you and I both teach forecasting classes and you've developed a teaching tool that you call a reforecast simulator with help from someone who would be a familiar face to <laughs> weather world viewers. What's, what's the idea behind the simulator? The yeah, simulator has been a really great project. Um, this was actually part of uh, Carl Schneider, who's of course a very familiar face to, to your viewers. Uh, this is part of his honors thesis project uh, when he was uh, doing his undergraduate degree here uh, in the program a year back. The idea behind it is basically sometimes as a forecaster, the weather is a little bit quiet and you need some unique or challenging opportunities to hone your skills. 
But also as we start to undergo this potential transition in our field, especially with things like web apps and so on, where forecasts become more automated and the role of the forecaster is to kind of look down from the top and make sure that things are running smoothly uh, and step in when the weather gets challenging, it's a chance for them to hone their skills and practice. So the idea is we simulate a forecasting environment. When you have those quiet days, you get the chance to interact with the weather forecast, look at maps uh, and look at an event that happened in the past. You don't know when it was, but we know when it was. Submit a forecast for a set of variables. And then luckily you can instantly verify a forecast. We can instantly know why things went right and why things went wrong, which as a meteorologist is a really, really great way to learn uh, just how to hone your skills uh, in the best possible way uh, through it all. Yeah, and, and before we go, I want to give you a chance to talk about some of the other research you're doing. Two, two topics come to mind right away when I think about your work. One of them is something called Rossby wave breaking. Could you just comment on that briefly? And the other one, you had your name on a paper called Gargantuan Hail. Tell us about <laughs> it. Yeah, so these are perhaps life at the extremes. Um, Rossby wave breaking, uh, many of your viewers are probably very familiar with this idea when you look at a weather map and how the jet stream has a kind of wave-like pattern to it. Uh, and much like waves in the ocean versus waves at a beach, these Rossby waves can also break in the atmosphere. When they occur, they tend to be some of the kind of nastiest weather you might imagine on a large scale. Big snowstorms, big windstorms, heat waves, and so on. Uh, and that work is trying to understand how those events uh, occur, why they occur, uh, and then how we expect those to change perhaps in a future climate. So we're doing that also, uh, not just with observations, but also with climate models as well. Uh, and then the HAIL project was a really neat one. Uh, this is one I, one I had a small part in. This is also uh, led by uh, Dr. Matt Kumjin uh, here in our department as well. Uh, and in this case, he was really looking at what we call gargantuan hail, which for reference size is, uh, is approximately the size of a honeydew melon or larger. And they were trying to understand the size uh, and the occurrence of why we saw hailstones that were pushing record breaking sizes in Argentina. Hailstones ranging from four to upwards of potentially nine inches uh, in size. So really spectacularly large hail. And that paper recently was highlighted in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society on the, on the cover page, yeah. It was indeed, yeah, it's, it's yeah. A, quite a unique one. Dr. Kevin Boley, Assistant Teaching Professor in our department, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for taking the time, John. And we'll be back in a moment with a recap of the short range forecast. 